Life in a trench, I'd like to explain in one word, horrific. It's mud, it's death, it's rats, it's stench. And soldiers develop an attitude in a trench that everybody is going to die. Life in the trench was abysmal. There were several lines of trenches. And the front line trenches, of course, were the most dangerous because they were constantly under fire. Into the line! The Germans dug assiduously, building dry, safe, and comfortable trenches for themselves with bunkers that actually had electricity and sometimes running water. The British and French, who were convinced that they were never going to be there for that long, didn't spend nearly the same effort. And so their trenches tended to be muddy and wet and not that safe. Disease ran rampant. It was very difficult to get any sort of sleep, a decent hot meal, keep your clothes dry, and more importantly, to keep your sanity. There were so many health problems of just simple disease that took much more men out of combat than direct fire. I think one word that would surprise people about life in a trench, boredom. A lot of time is spent just sitting, cleaning tools, and being scared to death the battle's gonna start any minute. It was just the day-to-day -day monotony being trapped in this very small space and fighting for a, a war that's really um, fought in inches. The idea of open warfare, of fighting out into what they called no man's land wasn't working. The technology of the war had advanced so much with machine guns, artillery that could lob shells a mile. It became mostly a defensive war early on, and as a defensive war, you wanted to protect your troops, so the miles and miles of trenches were built. There were often bodies buried in the sides of trenches, bodies lying out in the open in front of the trenches. The soldiers were experiencing not only the war that they were fighting at the moment, but the war that had been going on throughout those trenches for all of the years of the war. A young lieutenant writes his mother and says, I haven't been killed yet, but it's only a matter of time. That's typical of the way soldiers felt about life in the trench. You just did it. You existed day to day, tried to go on, keep your chin up, but one day, the bullet was going to have your name on it you were gonna perish. You weren't going home. A little short video there, of course, from the History Channel, of course, about how it was like to fight in a trench as a soldier. So welcome you back, Daniel Simon at Baton Rouge Community College. Hope everybody's having, of course, a great week uh, out there. Well, we had a great Halloween, by the way, uh, the other day. So. Uh, anyway, of course, this week I'll be kind of, you know, wrapping up on, of course, World War I. Uh, of course, I will talk a good bit about uh, what happens in Russia, Russian Revolution, which happens about the same time when World War I, of course, is going on. So it uh, looks like we got a bunch of students here. I know watching live right now. Uh, I know Lulu came in earlier. Good morning. Uh, hope you're having a great morning overall. And Steph, hey, what's going on? Uh, Christopher, what's up? Uh, of course, and also Sarah is also watching as well, along with Samaria also. So everybody's having a great week, and looks like Brittany's also coming in too uh, as well. So, uh, yeah, before I get started, I do have a new announcement I do want to talk about, which uh, I do have a new assignment I will be posting today, uh, which, uh, of course, I already got the second exam out, uh, which probably will be due sometime later in November, uh, I've got, but I will be uh, posting a new quiz on mostly World War I, uh, but I am including uh, part of that 19th century lecture uh, on uh, nationalism and imperialism, so kind of include that with it. Mostly it's on World War I uh, that I'll have. Uh, so those two assessments are the main ones I'm going to have out, of course, you know, I will uh, pretty much in early November. So uh, I'll talk about later, you know, in November, we, you know, we do have the uh, that next third vocab due, and of course the main thing due in November is those research paper, the, the book report, you know, do, uh, which some of you can start turning in early if you want, of course, this this month. So, yeah, pretty much November's here, and, 
Nah, not that far around the corner is the end of the semester. It's only a few weeks away, uh, especially after we get past Thanksgiving. All right. So, uh, of course, today, like I said, uh, I'm going to, of course, talk about, you know, mostly the end of World War One from, I guess, around pretty much 1917 up to, we'll get to 1919 with the uh, Treaty of Versailles. Uh, of course, that uh, helps to end World War One, but in a sense, it, you know, it causes World War II uh, later, a few decades later. Uh, mostly today, I'll talk about, uh, first off, the Russian Revolution, which uh, breaks out in 1917. That has a total effect, you know, not just on Russia, but Europe and other parts of the world. Uh, we'll see later uh, with that. I'll talk about how the United States gets into also World War I, uh, which a lot of that had to do with uh, Germany's uh, unrestricted uh, submarine warfare policy. So I'll get to that, and I'll talk about, of course, the end of the war also as well. So if you have any comments, questions, you know, during the live stream, or you can always, of course, leave me comments uh, on my channel uh, as as well. So, yeah, I'm going to first talk about the Russian Revolution, which, uh, of course, everybody's heard of Vladimir Lenin, right? Lenin, of course, one of the main figures uh, that was involved in the Russian Revolution. But uh, the Russian Revolution was not just one revolution. It was actually a series of revolutions that rocked Russia, of course, in 1917. And then it also caused, if you know about this, it also caused, you know, uh, the Russian Civil War. Uh, which would follow right afterwards. But main thing, of course, about the Russian Revolution was that it caused the end of the Russian Empire. Uh, the Romanov dynasty uh, collapsed, of course, also early in March 1917. And so that had a lot to do with, you know, why this would occur later in Russia. But uh, the causes, you know, the effects, you know, the Russian Revolution are quite complicated. They go back, you know, before... Uh, this even happened in 1917. Uh, so we talk about you know some of the different things that really helped cause the revolution. A lot of it was the fact that in Russia, you know, uh, you had uh, most of the people were still peasant origins. Uh, they were very impoverished. Uh, most of the upper classes controlled the state still. Uh, so you had that lack of reforms, which Russia didn't really do much in the 19th century to really solve the problems of Russia. Uh, then uh, the R Romanovs were still in power as absolutists, uh, even though you had, had the Russian Revolution of 1905, uh, which created like a, the Russian parliament, the Doom Duma, as they called it. Socialism was becoming popular in Russia, as it was in other parts of Europe. Uh, so that had a lot to do with it. Uh, and then military losses, like the losing the Russo-Japanese War uh, to, Jap to Japan in the Far East, uh, all of the casualties in World War I. Uh, that were also another issue uh, on top of that. Uh, so all that kind of helped to kind of, you know, create the Russian Revolution, uh, which would eventually break out in March of 1917. So I'll get to that, of course, uh, in a second about how that, of course, started. Uh, however, uh, if you look at this, uh, of course, map here uh, on there, by the way, is the uh, czar and his family. Nix II, of course, was in power, which... Or some people think he was not a competent ruler uh, that was ruling over Russia at the time. Uh, if you remember correctly, his father had been the czar previously, uh, who had been Alexander the uh, Third. And um, anyway, uh, the, we study about the war. World War One was not going well uh, for for Russia. Uh, if you know about what happened in the war, uh, Germany and the Central Powers were defeating. Uh, Russia, uh, who uh, their state was pretty much losing territory in Poland, especially in the Ukraine uh, that you're looking at in that map. And that kind of shows you, I guess, the front lines by early 1918 as uh, the Central Powers pushed uh, the Russian forces back towards Russia. And uh, the casualties were horrific. I don't know if you know much about Russia during World War One, but they had over five million uh, people that were killed in killed and wounded uh, in the war. I think the casualties vary, but I think they say that almost two million Russian men uh, were killed in World War One. Uh, if you throw in like the wounded and also the civilians that were, you know, also I guess killed in the war, uh, you're looking at somewhere between five and six million people. 
uh, that were killed or wounded. Then also you can see there another 3 million were captured uh, by the Central Powers also in the war. Now, if you look down at the Black Sea, you know, we were talking about before how the Ottoman Empire had come into the war. They had blockaded the Black Sea, and so we, the, the allies in the West couldn't supply Russia, and so it's like they were starving. Uh, that's what they were pretty much doing. Uh, then what happened was during the war, uh, Nicholas II decided to take control of the Russian forces uh, at the front line. So he, he went from, you know, St. Petersburg, which they called Petrograd during the war, and uh, basically uh, was at the front lines when the revolution, you know, would break out. And so what happened, if you know about it, was he left his wife, uh, Alexandra, Empress Alexandra, to basically run the government uh, in Petrograd. Uh, and then um, what happened on top of that, there was this man named Grigory, Grigory Rasputin, if you know about him, who was this religious mystic and holy man that had kind of become an influential advisor to uh, the Romanov family. Uh, he was kind of, with her, kind of controlling the government. And, uh, of course, he was often nicknamed the so-called Mad Monk, which maybe is a, more of a term that they later called him in Europe or in the West uh, more than anything. Uh, he was never really an official uh, priest in the Orthodox Church, but Apparently, they think he was some kind of mystical healer, uh, because uh, if you know about the son of um, of Nicholas II and Alexandra, um, Alexi, Alexi, I think his name was, Alexis, uh, he had hemophilia, and so somehow he was able to cure him, and so that made him very powerful in the family. Uh, they looked up to him a lot, uh, Rasputin, uh, and, uh, but eventually some of the uh, nobility got tired of this. They thought he was, you know, slowly, you know, taking over the government. Uh, and so, uh, if you know, it happened. They murdered Rasputin uh, in December of 1960. He was actually killed by uh, some pro-monarchists uh, that were led by this, um, actually two men, uh, one named Prince Felix Yusupov, uh, who was married to one of um, Nixon II's niece. Uh, and then also Grand Duke Dmitry Pavlovich, he was a cousin of Nicholas II. He also helped plan it as well. And so I think they invited um, Rasputin to uh, Yusupov's uh, house, uh, where uh, at first, if you know what happened with Rasputin, they tried to poison him, uh, is what happened uh, with cyanide, like in some wine and I think some cakes they gave him. And apparently when it didn't work, uh, they shot him, shot him in the chest, I think, originally. Uh, but then he still was alive, you know, about this. And eventually, I think they shot him in the head also as well. So so anyway, yeah, Rasputin, uh, that's kind of, some people think that was kind of an omen. Like when he got killed, uh, they think that was the end of the Romanovs, the dynasty and the empire. Uh, and so that happened kind of on the eve of the revolution later. Uh, then what happened was um, what occurred next, they had the so-called February Revolution that broke out, which uh, early March of 1917, I think is when, when it occurred. And basically in Petrograd, which is what they call uh, St. Petersburg back then during the war, uh, the people and the military revolted uh, against the czar. They refused to back him anymore as government. Now, there's kind of an incident where some of the army even shot some of the people, protesters against the government at, at that point. And, uh, and uh, so what ends up happening is uh, the, the, the czar, the czar, we see right here, this image, uh, he eventually abdicates the throne. That's what he does. He's at the front lines. And I think he was trying to get back to Petrograd, the capital. Uh, but he was forced to abdicate on March 2nd, 1917. Uh, and so that basically ended the whole, pretty much the whole, you know, Romanov dynasty. Uh, and also officially, I guess it ends the Russian Empire uh, at that point. Uh, so uh, that's kind of what goes on with, with, with the Russian government that right now. Uh, but what happens uh, right after that, the Duma takes over. The Duma is like the main uh, Russian parliament that had been established back in 1905. And so uh, they put in a, uh, what they call, so-called Russian provisional government that'll be in power until 
I guess, October, November of 1917. And so Russia becomes a republic uh, during this time period uh, without a monarch, uh, really without a main head of state uh, for, for a while. But uh, eventually what happens is, if you look at that image right here, uh, you get Alexander Kerensky that kind of comes in and takes over, who was a socialist. And at first he was the minister of justice and also the minister of war. Uh, but by uh, July July of 1917, he becomes prime minister uh, of the country. And uh, he'll, he'll kind of rule over the government uh, until the October Revolution breaks out uh, in really early November uh, of 1917 uh, is when it is. So Kerensky's kind of in power for a while, but eventually he's going to be forced into exile is what will occur. Uh, what happened next was then uh, Vladimir Lenin, if you know about this, and the Bolsheviks uh, eventually would seize power and take over the country. And uh, who, who, who was Lenin? Uh, Lenin was this uh, socialist or communist that uh, had been in exile for something like 17 years. He had been kicked out the country for being a radical uh, by the Russian government, imperial government. Uh, and he'd gone like, Tra kind of traveled all over all over Europe, uh, and he was uh, the leader of the Bolsheviks, which was uh, what they called the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, uh, which they called Bolshevik for short, which meant in uh, Russian uh, majority. Uh, they had another rival party that was called the Man Mensheviks, uh, which meant minority. And uh, they were known as like the they were far left Marxists that later uh, became known uh, later as the Russian Communist Party uh, in the Soviet Union. And um, if you know about Lenin, he had a motto uh, which the Re October Revolution became about, which is peace, land, and bread. Uh, which I think the the whole the whole thing uh, was actually. Um, peace, land, and bread, all power to the Soviet. Because uh, one of the things that happen after the um, Bolsheviks take over, if you know about it, is they start creating these uh, local governmental councils that they call a Soviet. And that's what they control a lot of the cities with initially when, I guess, the revolution broke out. And uh, he was involved, uh, of course, after, after um, the Tsar was overthrown, uh, and Kerensky, you know, and his government took over. That allowed uh, Lenin to uh, return uh, to Russia. And if you know what happened, uh, they think that the Germans did this. The Germans allowed Lenin to return uh, to Russia. I think it was a story where they put Lenin uh, in a railway car and sealed it up and said, don't open it until he gets back there. So they think that maybe the Germans were kind of conspiring uh, to use Lenin to overthrow that provisional government because the provisional government of Russia wanted to continue the war against Germany. And I think Lenin was against it. He wanted to end, end, end World War I because uh, he thought it was a capitalist war. Um, what happened after that, then, of course, you know what happened, the Bolsheviks will eventually seize power. But by, by the time of like early November 1917, uh, you have uh, what they call the October Revolution that occurs, which you see that painting right there where uh, the people stormed basically what is the Winter Palace, uh, where Kerensky's main government was, which the actual date was in November, early November, November 7th, 1917, uh, in the Gregorian calendar. November 6th or 7th, it's kind of a debate about what date it was. But um, because of the fact that they were in the, using the Julian calendar, it was actually October is when it was, when they actually stormed it right there. And uh, there's kind of a comical story about this, but apparently when they stormed it, they realized that nobody had filmed it. It was actually happening. They were storming the actual palace. And so they actually went back and reenacted what they did, and they filmed it. It's kind of stupid. Uh, but anyway, but that's basically, you know, basically in Petrograd, the Bolsheviks seize control uh, of the main government, and then they start slowly trying to take over Russia uh, at that point uh, between 1917 and 1918. And uh, that brings on, of course, you know, we'll get to it later, but it's going to eventually cause the 
Russian Civil War uh, to break out. Uh, here's, by the way, a timeline of the revolution you can see. So you got the October Revolution kind of occurring around somewhere between September and November when the Bolsheviks start trying to take over Russia at that point. Uh, you can see the Germans keep invading Russia. That's one thing that does happen uh, where the war keeps going on uh, afterwards. And you got the Civil War breaking out uh, in Russia uh, there was also a case where uh, Lenin tried to bring in some capitalism into the country to recover from the revolution and civil war uh, with this new economic policy. But I think apparently they were trying to convert Russia to being capitalist so they, they could then turn it to socialists. Uh, you know, it's kind of what one of the theories they had about socialism, that you had to be capitalist first before you became socialist and then communist. Um yeah, here, of course, an image, of course, of the Russian Civil War, which it peaked between 1918 uh, and 1921. Uh, mostly the Russian Civil War was a power struggle, struggle in the country between those that were communist and then those that were non-communist. Uh, so you had those like the Bolsheviks that wanted to take Russia and the regions around it and make it into like a socialist country. And then yeah, those were non-communist. Uh, forces in Russia, uh, and then forces that were outside Russia, like allies in Europe and so on, uh, that wanted uh, to basically prevent this from going on. Uh, and so you have like Japan, the United States even sent forces to try and stop basically uh, this civil war. Uh, and uh, so you had two sides that really fought in the revolution, uh, in this actual civil war. Uh, you had the Reds, which was like Red Russians is what they called those who were communists. They were backed by a military that they called the Red Army, which later is what they call sometimes the nickname was Soviet, Soviet Army that they had. And then on the other side, you had the White Army, uh, which they are called White Russians or Whites, basically. These were those who were non-communists, uh, those that were supportive of the Romanovs. Uh, they wanted to restore the Romanovs back to power, things like that. Uh, and um, they had different leaders that were in there that were involved in the Civil War. You had Leon Trotsky, uh, who you see there in that image. Trotsky was a socialist communist that um, basically was the one that helped create the Red Army uh, during uh, the, the, the Russian Civil War. And um, he later was a rival to Stalin, if you know about this. And Stalin later had him exiled. He's kind of an interesting figure uh, during also the Russian, Revol Russian Revolution and Civil War. Uh, Admiral Alexander Kolchak, you may have heard of him. He was actually one of the leaders uh, on the other side uh, with the white, white armies or white Russians. Uh, and uh, he kind of led their forces, I think mostly, I want to say in Siberia. And he was later captured at the end of the war and killed, though. And they kind of saw him as a puppet of the West. But you had all these different, um, you know, um, allied powers like in Europe. They were sending forces uh, to fight like in Western Russia. U.S. sent forces too uh, into different parts of Russia like Siberia, et cetera. And then I think Japan even sent forces uh, into Russia to try to stop, stop the Reds as well. So, uh, but of course, you know, too late, you know, what happens with the Tsar's family, you know, you know about what happens to them, they, they killed them too, uh, the Tsar and his family, uh, they were kind of concerned that they would uh, get, you know, retaken by, you know, the white armies and try to put them back in power, uh, and so in July of 1918, uh, the Bolsheviks in Lenin had Nix II and his whole family killed. Um, so even his wife and his children uh, were all murdered. They were shot down with mostly revolvers and pistols, which was kind of like almost like mafia kind of, you know, executions, uh, the way they did it. Kind of horrific what happened. And they took their bodies and they buried them in a mass grave. Uh, so uh, they actually did not find their bodies until, I think, after the fall of the Soviet Union. Like, I want to say in the early 1990s, 1991, I think, was the year and they found uh, the remains of the Romanov family. And you may have heard rumors how one of them survived, which is uh, Anastasia. Uh, that proved to be wrong. Uh, they later found out from DNA tests uh, that she was killed uh, also as well. Because I think there was a 
imposters kind of running around uh, in Europe saying that they were um, Anastasia. I think it was a woman named Anna Anderson, I think her name was, that claimed uh, she was Anastasia. But that proved to be kind of false. Uh, of course, the big thing that happened with the Russian Revolution in the Civil War uh, was that the Soviet Union then was founded uh, after the white armies were beaten. You get the USSR created in 1922, and of course it lasts for close to about 70 years. So you can see it included territories that was not just Russia, uh, but areas that were you know around it, including at one point the Ukraine was kind of in it, uh, Belarus, uh, the Baltic states, Georgia, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, you know, et cetera, were basically all in it. And of course, all that broke up, you know, after um, the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991. Uh, and so that's why Russia is kind of the way it is now today. And maybe that's why Russia wants to get back territory that's, you know, in that Western part. So anyway, it's kind of like talking about the Russian Revolution, what happened. Now, I will talk briefly for a few things that happens, of course, uh, also after, I guess I'll kind of go into it right now and discuss what happened after the Russian Civil War. Uh, Lenin uh, ruled as the first leader uh, of the Soviet Union, which uh, he would die uh, in um, 1924. Uh, and then, of course, this man would take over, you see here, which is, Joseph Stalin, who would become a totalitarian dictator uh, over the Soviet state for almost like 30 years, like up to like 1953, uh, he was in power. So he was one of their longest reigning leaders uh, that he had. Uh, Lenin only ruled for like maybe about four years as the main leader uh, of the Soviet Union. And um, if you know about him, uh, under him, he developed what they call Stalinism. But Stalinism was his idea of communism within one nation uh, over the other idea, which is permanent world revolution, which uh, Trotsky had wanted. Trotskyism, I think they call it sometimes. Uh, and I think Trotsky had wanted to make the whole world, you know, like communist, that kind of thing. Uh, but Lenin solidly believed that the only way to do it was to create communism within one country each. Uh, like basically socialist republics uh, was what they called it. Uh, Stalin was known for a lot of things. Uh, if you know about him, uh, he was very famous for his purges. We'll kind of talk about that today. But this one thing he did, Stalin was the so-called Great Terror, where he began to purge uh, the Soviet Union of anybody that was kind of seen as a threat to, the, to this new state that they had created. Uh, and so you have this political repression period where anybody... Uh, he thought was a threat to him in the Communist Party, uh, the military, uh, any of the peasants. Uh, a lot of them were either rounded up, imprisoned, killed, and a lot of them were sent to, you know, about this, the, the gulag. We'll get to that later that they have. Uh, There's even these uh, state show trials that took place in the 1930s where uh, a lot of Bolsheviks, uh, former ones, were actually put on trial in uh, either imprisoned or exiled. Trotsky was, was actually exiled himself, uh, if you know about that. Stalin later had him murdered, I think in Mexico, which is crazy. Uh, under Stalin, they had the NKVD, which was the Soviet secret police, uh, which was run by this man named Leventry uh, Berea, who actually ran it. And under him, they shot like something like one to two million people uh, in, in, in the Soviet Union. And then millions were imprisoned at one point uh, in the so-called gulag system, which was this huge uh, slave labor prison system they had that was kind of similar to like the German concentration camps that they, they had overall. And um, kind of get some images of this right here, but the uh, map of the gulag system, you can see it in this uh, map right here, uh, it was a huge network, by the way, of forced labor camps. They think that Vladimir Lenin initially developed, they think, around the 1920, early 1920s, and then Stalin began to expand it, and then it peaked under, they think, Nikita Khrushchev's uh, time when he was in power uh, as a Soviet le uh, leader. Uh, so you can see there uh, the Gulag population, you can see it may have gone up from like 3 million initially and they think that as many as 18 million people may have passed 
through the system. Uh, and there's kind of been a debate about how many people died in the gulag. It's not as bad, you know, compared to like what the concentration death camps of, you know, say Germany did with the Nazis. Uh, but maybe as many as 2 million people may have actually died uh, in these actual gulag camps. Uh, one of the most notorious is Kolyma. You may have heard about it, uh, which uh, which was a camp up in Siberia, uh, kind of in the northern part of Siberia. And uh, that one was considered one of the worst ones ever that they talk about sometimes. Uh, there's other ones like that you may have heard of called Perm 36, uh, which was a famous Gulag prison penal colony uh, that was created, I think, mostly close to where the Urals is. So a lot of these, I think like Perm 36 was around, I want to say, up to the time of Khrushchev. Uh, of course, later they found out about the Gulag system, if you know about this, and books were later written about it. Like, I know Alexander Solonitsyn, who wrote the Gulag Archipelago and books like The One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich, uh, helped to kind of uncover all the atrocities that were committed by uh, the Soviet government under Stalin. Uh, and uh, they're not sure how many people died under Stalin. They think, they think a lot of his policies may have led to as many as 20, 30 million people actually perishing uh, under him because of his political repression and all the different policies of it. And Stal Stalin... Um, he was involved in a lot of different things. I'll kind of mention about briefly. Uh, they were kind of famous about him. Uh, he had this thing called the five-year plans you may have heard about. Uh, these were plans to try and modernize the Soviet Union uh, very quickly because they were kind of concerned that Russia and its states around it were kind of you know backwards and not industrialized like the European powers were. They thought that's why they had fared badly in World War I. Uh, and so that included collectivization of all their farmland. So starting, in, they think, in 1928, Stalin began to collectivize all the agriculture throughout the country because they thought they would need all this food to feed all these workers uh, you know, in their industries. And so it actually caused man-made famines like in Ukraine, like the Holodomor, you may have heard about, where several million Ukrainians died of, like, lack of food, like, starved to death, pretty much. And so uh, that's part of why Ukrainians don't like the Russians. And a lot to do with some of these policies that went back to uh, the time of, of Joseph Stalin. And I think it's Khrushchev is the one that we know about later that would actually divide, you know, um, Ukraine from, from Russia, which is why we're having all the problems now today. Oh, Stalin also eliminated a lot of the middle class peasants uh, who he called bourgeoisie because uh, he kind of considered them almost like upper middle class because uh, they were more wealthy to do uh, type peasants that owned land. And they were called kulaks. And so those kind of people were also rounded up too and thrown uh, into the gulag or sent to Siberia or even killed. Uh, and so uh, large populations, you know, throughout you know, Russia were actually eliminated by Stalin uh, because of his, some of his policies. Uh, but Stalin's kind of rehabilitated. Uh, if you know about him, uh, he becomes kind of a hero uh, in uh, World War II, uh, defeating, you know, Nazi Germany and Adolf Hitler. And so uh, he's kind of, uh, you know, around until like the early part of the Cold War uh, when he dies in 1953. So those are some of the policies of Stalin that he's kind of far well known for. A lot of people forget all these things now. I think Russia kind of wants to become a bigger power now than what it is. Uh, they kind of want to go back to the glory days of the Soviet Union, uh, but not the, what Stalin did in those days. Now, I'm going to talk about next, the other big thing that happens, uh, you know, besides what's going on with the Russian Revolution, is the, the fact that the United States enters the war uh, in, in 1917, which a lot of these were due to uh, Germany, like a lot of the Germans' aggression that was going on uh, in the Atlantic due to the, some of their naval policies, that had to do with why uh, we came into the war for the United States. Uh, what they call unrestricted submarine warfare, where uh, the Germans began sinking any kind of allied shipping that could help the war effort uh, against Germany. It's something they start doing a lot. And um, 
If you know about the war, one of the major issues that led to it was the sinking of Lusitania, which happened in May of 1915, uh, when uh, this passenger liner, uh, which was owned by the Cunard Company, uh, went down uh, close in the North Atlantic near the Irish Sea. And um, occurred on May 7th was the day. Uh, it was sunk by a German U-boat, and um, it killed close to about not quite almost 1,200, but maybe 1,190 something passengers uh, were killed uh, on the Lusitania. And because of the fact that there were Americans on board, you see close to 130, 128 maybe, may have been the Americans uh, that, that were killed on, on the ship, that outraged a lot of people in America, uh, including President Wilson, who uh, wanted to go to war with Germany at this point. I think even the Secretary of State, William Jennings Bryan, resigned uh, because of this whole issue of the Lusitania sinking. And so um, it really caused the United States to, to come in and, you know, a lot of anti-German sentiments in the country kind of kind of come about uh, because of that. And so Americans want to support the Allied war effort, you know, pretty much after that. So that's, that's part of it. It's very important. You know, the whole, you know, reason why we get in the war later uh, is because of this incident, but it's going to take a while for us to really get directly involved. But I know our munitions factories and things like that uh, start supporting the war, uh, sending munitions over and things like that. And actually, they say when the Lusitania went down, uh, there were actually munitions on board uh, that were bound to Europe uh, to fight against the Germans. Yeah, here's an image of the Lusitania, of course, right there. It's kind of a tragedy. Uh, when it got only hit by one torpedo uh, from this U-boat U-20, but uh, it sank in like 18 minutes, which was part of why uh, very few people could get out of uh, the ship. I think it sank on its side, uh, which was kind of tragic. Here's other images right here. Here's of course, they've done a lot of paintings of the Lusitania, which has kind of been kind of compared maybe to the Titanic sinking like in 1912, but more of a man-made reason why it sunk, of course, from a torpedo. Uh, also, the other thing that really leads to why the United States got involved, of course, uh, was the Zimmerman telegram. Uh, prior to this, uh, if you know about it, the Germans had suspended unrestricted submarine warfare because uh, they were kind of fearful that uh, the United States was going to come into the war. And so they made this pledge uh, that was called the Sussex Pledge or Sussex, I think, ultimatum is what they also called it. And what the Germans said was that they were going to warn non-combatant ships before they sank them. Uh, but uh, I think what happened was uh, they realized by uh, 1917 that they would have to probably go back resuming unrestricted submarine warfare uh, and so uh, there was an incident where apparently the German and, uh, foreign secretary, his name was Arthur Zimmerman, had this idea to contact the German ambassadors in Mexico and see if they could get Mexico to support the Central Powers, because they were hoping that they would join them uh, to fight the United States, maybe attack the United States. And uh, they were hoping that that would uh, basically distract us and prevent us from really getting in the war. Uh, here's an image, by the way, of um, there is Arthur Zimmerman right there. So he's the one who proposed the actual alliance uh, with Mexico. Uh, part of the promise uh, in the Zimmerman telegram or Zimmerman note uh, was that they were going to give land back to Mexico uh, in exchange for you know getting their, I guess them involved. And I think Germany was going to give them military aid uh, to fight the United States. Uh, here's the actual Zimmerman telegram, which they think was intercepted by the British. And um, Texas, uh, New Mexico, Arizona, uh, those were territories that we had taken uh, from Mexico back during the Mexican-American War back in the 19th century. So they were kind of promising to give that back to them. Uh, and I think it was even this idea to get Japan to get into the war uh, to fight to fight also uh, the United States. Is, you know, they were trying to get Japan to back the Central Powers too, you know, nothing to there. Uh, and so uh, what happened eventually is that we decided that we were going to get in the war uh, at that point. 
Uh, and so uh, what happened was the United States declared war, of course, uh, on uh, Germany. Uh, Congress, of course, declared war on April 6th, 1917. And so now we were really in the war at that point directly, because at this point we were just, you know, uh, sending munitions over there to basically aid uh, the Allied cause against Germany. And now after that, we pretty much had gotten in the war. Uh, Wilson, by the way, said it best. He said that uh, the world must be sa made safe for democracy. That was his kind of quote about that. But it's funny how, like, when he ran for president, I think they say in 19, I guess it was 1916, uh, he ran on a slogan, which was, he kept us out of war. <laughs> so I guess in the end, they got in the war anyway. So that ends up, what ends up happening, the, the United States didn't really have much of a military at, at that point. Like when World War, World War I broke out, our army was nothing, you know, compared to all these other powers uh, that were in, in the war. Uh, and so uh, they would have to draft a lot of men. And so uh, Congress passed what they call the Selective Service Act in 1917, which you can see right there. And so you can see they drafted men initially 21 to 30 uh, to serve in the war. And I think later they extended to 18 to 45 by 1918 uh, as well, because they need, I guess, maybe younger men, older men uh, also to be involved. And so 24 million men uh, registered for the draft uh, by 1918. Uh, you can see over 2 million were drafted and actually served in World War I uh, to give you an idea. Uh, by the way, our casualties were like 120, 130 range, I think is how many were killed uh, in World War I. Uh, most of the men that were drafted into the war were from the working class, like the lower classes. Uh, very few of the upper classes actually fought. You see there, only 1% of the college educated actually fought in the war. So that's something you really don't see more until probably Vietnam, more college-educated men fighting in war. Now, uh, what happened was uh, they had to, they formed this army, which they, they call it later the, the American Expeditionary Force or Forces, uh, or also called the e AEF. And uh, you can see there General John J. Pershing, who was also called, by the way, Black Jack Pershing, uh, became the one that would eventually lead the American forces that would fight in France uh, against Germany, uh, that would fight with the Allied forces of France and Britain, uh, etc. And uh, Pershing was considered one of the most decorated soldiers in American history. Uh, he, if you know about him, uh, he was involved in the Spanish-American War, uh, you know, went up San Juan Hill uh, with Teddy Roosevelt and the Rough Riders. Uh, he was also involved in... Uh, the U.S. takeover, the Philippines, Filipino War, they fought, by the way, uh, right after that conflict. And then he was also the one that went after Pancho Villa. We heard the Pancho Villa Mex Mexican punitive expedition uh, where he tried to capture uh, Pancho Villa, who was a Mexican bandit in northern Mexico, uh, but he later failed. Uh, but he's the one who was the top general that really led the American forces. And we don't really have our own separate army over there fighting until really 1918. Uh, mostly the Americans fight with pretty much the French and British side by side. Uh, we did have some other forces that went over there, too. You may have heard of MacArthur, Douglas MacArthur, who was later a famous general in World War II. But he organized this uh, thing called the 42nd Division, uh, which they also called it, by the way, the so-called Rainbow Division. And uh, these were actually National Guardsmen that went over to, to France uh, to fight in the war. They were actually the first ones to get there and fight. He was actually a colonel at the time, but he's later famous for, of course, being a general. They called him later Dugout Doug. Uh, it was, was his nickname in World War I. Uh, now, one big thing that came out of, by the way, the end of the war was the 14 points. I did want to talk about that, uh, which was very famous uh, this was something that Woodrow Wilson, the president of the United States, issued in January, I think January 8th, 1918, uh, in a speech before Congress. And what it did was it outlined basically a peace plan uh, to end the, end, end the war in Europe, to try to shorten the war. And also it kind of outlined ideas to solve the political differences of Europe, the, I guess the cause of what it caused the war. Uh, in the end. 
And I'll kind of uh, show you right here, but it's got some ideas. So he wanted to create a new world order to ensure peace in the future. Uh, also, he wanted to address the boundaries of Europe and uh, you know national self-determination of various nationalities that he thought needed countries uh, and things like that. Uh, settle disputes internationally, which uh, his big idea uh, that Wilson created, uh, if you know about it, is the so-called League of Nations, which was this international government peace organization, uh, which we eventually found in 1920 uh, to try and solve the, I guess, the political differences between countries diplomatically rather than by war. And Wilson later got the Nobel Peace Prize for it, for this idea. It was a great idea at the time. Uh, later, it work, wouldn't work out, you know, with World War II. Uh, but they do think the League of Nations would, would be eventually the catalyst that would create the United Nations that's around today. So it's the kind of like the prototype organization uh, to that. Uh, that's the list, of course, of Wilson's 14 points. Uh, they were kind of famous. So first one, open diplomacy, was an idea that he wanted, uh, which he was hoping to use with the League of Nations. Freedom of seas, freedom of trade. Arms reductions. That was kind of a joke, though, number four. Five, uh, colonial self-determination was something he wanted where countries like in Africa, et cetera, uh, could have their own countries. Uh, that's an idea they had. Six to eight, German evacuation from Russia, Belgium, France, uh, including the Franco-Prussian War losses. Germany had to give back Alsace-Lorraine to France, as an example. Uh, nine, Italian national unification, which kind of already happened, but I think they were talking about adding more territory uh, to what should be Italy. Ten, Austro-Hungarians given freest opportunity of autonomous development. That has to do with, like, countries being formed out of Austria-Hungary, which will. Uh, Eleven, realignment of Balkans. They led to Yugoslavia, of course. Twelve, division of modern empire. Uh, of course, self-determining of peoples that live there, like the Arabs wanted their states uh, that were there. Also, Turkey would develop out of that too. 13, independent Poland. Then 14, the 14th point, of course, uh, was the League of Nations. Uh, that last one, uh, which is the one he's more famous for. So yeah, those are the conditions of peace, uh, of course, that were you know put in Europe. Uh, a lot of the people in Europe liked these ideas. Uh, although if you know about it, Wilson was later criticized uh, for some of these ideas being too idealistic that they wouldn't work uh, in the end. Some of it did work, some of it didn't, you know, uh, in the future. We'll talk more later about how that comes about later with the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, the war would keep going, though. Like, in, you go, go to, like, you know, what happened with um, the end of World War I in 1918. Uh, Russia was out of the war. Russia, if you know about it, sued for peace uh, in March of 1918 with the so-called brest litovsk Treaty, where uh, I guess the early Soviet Union, Soviet state uh, under Lenin uh, sued for peace for Germany, losing a lot of territory. They lost like Ukraine, part of Poland, Finland uh, to the Germans uh, in the war. And so what that meant was that Germany only really had to fight a one front war uh, in the West. So it kind of helped Germany uh, really in the war. And so, yeah, there was a case where Germany tried to counterattack with a big spring offensive, which uh, was called Operation Michael, which happened in the spring, March, April of 1918. Uh, but they were only able to push back the Allies like 40 miles uh, in some spots. They were hoping to end the war right there uh, at that point because they were kind of concerned the Americans were going to come in and change the whole war, the outcome of it. And so what happened was the uh, Allies basically counterattacked is what they did. And really the thing that really ends World War I uh, in 1918 uh, is the 100 Days Offensive, which was a, that was a series of um, battles that were on, on the Western Front where uh, basically the forces of France, Britain, the United States, and others combined their forces uh, to basically attack the Hindenburg Line uh, in northern France, uh, in Belgium. And um, the Allies eventually broke it. They broke the Hindenburg Line uh, with basically a lot of forces, like somewhere between six to seven million troops were involved, uh, including 
American forces. And uh, our big battle that we fought in, uh, like the United States, if you know about it, uh, was the Moose Argonne battle, uh, also called uh, the Battle of the Argonne Forest. And uh, they consider that to be, by the way, one of the largest battles that the United States ever fought in. Something like 26,000 men uh, were actually killed uh, in that battle. 115, I think, is the total amount of men that were killed probably in the war, maybe a little more uh, than that. And um, on the right there, you may have heard of uh, Sergeant Alvin York. He was considered one of the greatest heroes uh, of the Oregon battle. Uh, he was originally from Paul Ball, Tennessee, by the way. He later got the uh, Medal of Honor in 1918. Uh, but um, pretty much at that point, the uh, Allied side was starting to lose the war. Uh, in fact, their forces, uh, if you know about it, get pushed back into Belgium. And um, what ends up happening is the 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 uh, ally, the, uh, the 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 Germans at that point decide that you know since they're getting they, the war is almost over uh, for them their, their armies start collapsing their government starts collapsing back at home and you get this so-called German revolution that is sparked uh, back in the German homeland uh, and so uh, one of the things that happened. Uh, right before this was that the Kaiser, Kaiser Wilhelm, Kaiser Wilhelm II, it should be actually, that should be, uh, abdicates the throne uh, and flees to Holland uh, at that point. And so the Germans are going to form basically what will be a Republican government after the war, which will be called the Weimar Republic. Uh, and they decide to end the war at that point. Because uh, I guess they're kind of concerned that the Allies are going to push into Germany, maybe take more territory uh, from them. And so on November 11th, 1918, they decide to basically sign a ceasefire agreement uh, in northern France uh, at a location called the Forest of Compiègne. Uh, and that was signed on, on no, November 11th, 1918. Uh, I think they met early in the morning uh, and agreed to basically uh, a ceasefire of the war uh, at 11 a.m. Uh, and so the whole saying about, you know, World War One was that it ended on the 11th day of the 11th hour of the 11th month. Uh, and uh, if you know about um, November 11th, it's now known as different names. I know in, you know, in the United States and I think in Europe, they still call it Armistice Day. Uh, but now and in the United States today, it's now called Veterans Day, now a federal holiday, uh, as you know, uh, to honor not just World War I veterans, but all veterans, you know, overall. That's something that basically uh, occurs later, uh, after after World War I. Uh, they sign it, by the way, in a railway car, which you can see there, 5 a.m. is when the Allies uh, and the German representatives met there. I think I've got an image showing you uh, the actual rail car uh, where uh, the actual armistice was signed in uh, to end the war. That's kind of an interesting railway car, by the way. Uh, Ferdinand Foch, he was the actual general, led pretty much the Allied forces in France, uh, is the one that convened the actual uh, signing of the armistice. And uh, later, uh, when World War II would occur, if you know about it, uh, Hitler, when he invaded France uh, in 1940 uh, would knock the French out of the war, World War II. He would take that railway car and later force the French to sign a similar armistice uh, to end World War II with them. I think he later had it blown up, uh, if you know about that. Now, the war wasn't over yet, even though they signed this arm. That officially kind of ends the shooting, I guess, of the war uh, at that point. They you know, still got to agree to treaties uh, to basically end the war. And so that led to the Paris Peace Conference uh, that met uh, between January to June of 1919 uh, in Paris, France. Uh, and uh, if you know about the proceedings of it uh, at the actual Paris Peace Conference, uh, it was dominated by four states and their main leaders, uh, which were uh, the United States, uh, Britain, France, and also Italy. Uh, and 
Um, I'll kind of show you an image showing you uh, kind of the actual Paris Peace Conference. Well, we'll get to it later, but what's going to end up happening, it's going to later lead to the, the conference is going to create the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, that'll come out of it, uh, which will be signed, you see, on that date of June 28th, 1919, which, by the way, happens to be the fifth anniversary of when the Archduke Franz Ferdinand was shot. What could go wrong with that? Uh, and it was signed in the Hall of Mirrors, which is later why it's called the Treaty of Versailles. I'll get to it later, but this treaty is very harsh. It, it actually blamed Germany for the war. Uh, they tried to punish the state uh, after the war to prevent, I guess, Germany from coming back again and threatening countries like France. But it later ends up causing, you know, World War II uh, to occur uh, instead. Yeah, they talk about the big four, uh, which, you know, if you know about it, those were the four main representatives uh, that were at uh, the Paris Peace Conference that represented those four main countries. Uh, those were the four men, of course, that were famous. You had uh, the prime minister of uh, Britain, which was David Lloyd George. He was the ruler. Uh, they had George Clemenceau, uh, who was the prime minister uh, of France. Uh, they had also... Uh, the Prime Minister of, of, of Italy, which was uh, Vittorio Orlando, and then uh, the United States had, of course, Woodrow Wilson, of course, the president as well. Uh, if you can't figure out which one it is, uh, uh, David Lloyd George is the one on the far left. Uh, the one that's pointing his finger at George uh, is um, Vittorio Orlando. The guy with the walrus mustache, that's uh, George Clemenzo. Well, I think he had a nickname. They called him the Tiger. And then, uh, of course, Wilson on the far left, excuse me, far right. Um, he was the tallest one there. Uh, he was the president of the United States, of course, at the time. And um, if you know about Clemenzo, he hated Wilson and some of his ideas. Uh, like, he didn't really like the 14 points. He thought they were too idealistic. And he made a remark that was kind of a joke. He said that Holy Almighty God had 10, like the Ten Commandments. Um Kind of talk about the treaty. It took them a while, but they hammered it out. And pretty much the British, uh, the French, the United States, uh, they kind of compromised on the whole issues and pretty much dominated the proceedings of the actual Paris Peace Conference. Italy really didn't do much. They were just there because they wanted some territory uh, from Austria, Hungary, uh, more than anything. Uh, but after the treaty was signed, you know, it would later lead to the League of Nations being created afterwards, which wasn't really finalized until 1920 uh, more than anything. But here's kind of a things you can see here, a list of all the different issues that were kind of put in uh, to the treaty. There were kind of ways to, you know, punish Germany uh, after the war. Uh, Germany, you can see there, had to demilitarize the Rhineland on its western border, which kind of see in that red area in that map at the top right. Uh, the Saar Basin, if you know about it, the French took a lot of natural resources like coal, coal from them uh, as well. Uh, the big thing, they had to pay war reparations, 33 billion or about roughly uh, had to be paid to the Allies uh, for damages done uh, by the Germans uh, in World War I. Return conquered lands. Alsace-Lorraine, of course, was a big thing. Uh, they had to return Belgium, obviously, had returned that too. And then uh, the Germans lost a lot of territory, like overseas, Africa. They lost their colonies uh, in the Pacific. They lost colonies uh, also as well. Uh, reduced military, uh, to only 100,000 defensive men. Uh, they could only have six battleships, uh, no submarines. They couldn't have an Air Force uh, either. Oh, and then they had this thing called the War Guilt Clause uh, that's sometimes called Article 231. Uh, they basically were blamed for the war also as well. So those were all issues that were pretty much put on the Germans. And you're saying, like, why did they just, like, say, I'm not going to do all that? Well, if they would have not supported that idea of, what went into the treaty, uh, they would have been invaded uh, by the Allies. Uh, and so they were kind of forced to, like, basically sign it more than anything. They weren't even at the conference. They were just basically the Allies just kind of said, this is what you're going to have to do, basically, 
uh, with this treaty. So a lot of the Germans felt like uh, this whole treaty was, you know, too harsh uh, on Germany overall. And that's part of why it led to the rise of Hitler and the Nazis, you know, between World War One and World War Two, because uh, they wanted revenge for what happened with the Treaty of Versailles. I've got a few minutes left. Let me kind of talk about a few other things that happened, too, uh, with also uh, after the war. Uh, if you look at this image here, you can see how uh, one of the big things that happened was the treaty also created a lot of new countries uh, throughout uh, Europe. Czechoslovakia was created, Poland, uh, Yugoslavia, Finland uh, became a new country. Austria and Hungary became separated. That's one big thing. That happened uh, also as well. Romania became a larger country, especially in the western part of it uh, also. Baltic states were recognized. So Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, all those are countries that became separate uh, afterwards. Uh, they were created. Uh, the only thing about it was it created all these countries that were kind of weak in Central Eastern Europe. And it's going to enable Nazi Germany and play the Soviet Union to easily take them. That's the only bad thing about that. Also, the League of Nations created mandates uh, to govern the defunct territories of the Ottoman Empire. So the areas of like Lebanon, Syria, Israel, Jordan, Iraq uh, were all basically uh, taken over and governed by the British and the French. And so they were kind of deciding like what was going to happen uh, to all these territories. And the Arabs creating their states there throughout that region won't come until after World War II. So that'll be later. And you can see all the African Pacific territories uh, were kind of divided up by some of the European powers and even the Americans took some territory along with Japan. Uh, of course, another big thing that was, you know, we see about World War I was the amount of people that died in the war, which was, you know, like I said, in the millions uh, that were killed uh, in World War I. Uh, the amount of soldier deaths vary somewhere between 9 and 11. Usually 10 million is a good amount, I guess, on average. That probably died total on both sides combined uh, overall. But if you had civilian deaths, you might be looking at another 15, 20 million uh, that may have died uh, in World War I. So they're not sure the amount of deaths total in World War I. It's kind of, World War II is kind of like that, too, uh, also. But look at here. You can see those are some of the countries that you know, took the amount of deaths. So Russia, Germany, uh, those two countries had the most, most deaths uh, in World War I. France, 1.3 million. Austria-Hungary, 1.2 million, you can see. Uh, British Empire, almost a million uh, people died uh, in the war. But don't forget all the people that got wounded, too, which was probably even more, uh, you can see, on that right column uh, right there. But the amount of deaths... Is debated about how many people you know were killed, obviously, but one in eight young men in France may have died from the war. Kind of gave you an idea of the amount of deaths. 62% of all European men fought at some point uh, in the war. 30 million men may have been totally wounded uh, at one point. And you can see the amount of money that they spent on the war uh, was something like 180 billion. That must be in modern dollars today. Uh, but they spent, obviously, a lot of money, of course, fighting uh, this war uh, overall. Uh, don't forget, they also had this other thing called the influenza pandemic that kind of broke out around 1918, uh, which uh, was basically an outbreak of influenza, which they think was caused by swine flu uh, that they think started in the United States uh, somewhere in the Midwest, like Kansas, I think was likely the location but they think when it's when it started. And at one point you can see it, it infected something like 20% of the world's population that may have gotten uh, the flu, which the amount of deaths vary. 20, 40 million uh, is about how many people uh, may have died from, from the influenza. Uh, they have some numbers that go up to like 50 to 100 million, which is insane, I know. Uh, but they think they think the amount of deaths may have been worse than what it was. And um, you can see the highest mortality rate was mostly the younger people from their 20s into their 40s. Uh, and so uh, they think they think that the influenza epidemic started in the United States. And what happened was soldiers brought it to Europe. And then from there, 
it spread all over Europe uh, at one point. And uh, you can see uh, somewhere between 600 to 700,000 Americans died uh, of, of the influenza pandemic, uh, which was, I think, almost 1% of the U.S. population at the time. That's a pretty good amount uh, that almost died, died from it. Uh, they called it different names. Uh, if you know about this, they call it the Spanish flu because uh, there's a story going around that the king of Spain got it. Uh, in the influenza. I, think, I don't think he died from it, uh, but apparently because of the fact that Spain wasn't using censorship as much as we were, uh, they knew more about it, and so you would call it that nickname, but it had nothing to do with Spain, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, but uh, it has been kind of somehow, you know, today compared to COVID, like when COVID happened, uh, you know, they shut down schools and churches and theaters and things like that, and so it, was kind of, it has been compared to that, you know, COVID versus the flu. And actually, the Spanish flu was worse than COVID. Uh, like Percentage-wise, it killed more Americans uh, compared to how the COVID did uh, overall. So that, that's part of why, you know, the whole, I guess, the casualties of World War I are kind of increased because of what happened uh, with the influenza pandemic. Because they say in World War I that more more soldiers died from disease, really, from the actual war uh, itself. Uh, later uh, next week, I'll get into, like, talking about the rise of fascism. I'm actually not going to have a lecture until probably next Wednesday, because uh, I'll kind of have something I got planned for Monday, like an assignment. Uh, I think we've pretty much got enough ma main, um, you know, assessments right now uh, that are out, of course, uh, but next week, I'll kind of get into that issue and talk about how between the wars, you got the rise of these fascist dictators uh, that take over Germany, you know, Italy, uh, Japan also becomes fascist uh, as well. Uh, so we'll talk about that because that's the lead in to, you know, World War II. Uh, that's going to happen uh, by, by the late 1930s. Uh, so that's something I'll kind of get into later. But I'll probably have some other like Monday. I'll probably have some kind of um, assessment I'm going to probably give you. Uh, for like bonus points, because uh, I think we're kind of ahead right now on lecture wise uh, for the fourth semester. So uh, right now, y'all should be concentrating on two main assessments. Of course, uh, the second exam is the main thing uh, y'all should be working on, which remember that is on the lectures on the French Revolution, Asia Napoleon, and also the first two lectures uh, up to like the, uh, I think up to like I think that's on that one on the uh, up to the uh, socialism, I think is where that ends. And then, of course, the third lecture I've got on uh, the 19th century, which is nationalism and socialism, that'll, of course, be added into the World War I quiz uh, that I'm posting, of course, today. But don't forget, book reports later due uh, in kind of like mid-November. Uh, so that's something y'all should be kind of working on right now. And you know, if you haven't sent me, you know, what book you want to read uh, for the semester, you know, do let me know, of course, about that. Uh, I think we have a third vocab also due, I know, uh, later in mid-November uh, as well. Uh, if you still have time, you know, if you're still interested in that Veterans Project, anybody, you know, if anybody's out there still doing it, uh, but uh, that's going to be due later uh, in December, I think December 9th during um, final exam. So, yeah, we're not that far away from the end of the semester. We only got a few weeks left. I know we have Thanksgiving coming up. Uh, and all that, but uh, semester's you know approaching pretty fastly, so y'all want to you know keep up with those uh, various assignments that are out there. So that's it for today. Uh, don't look like I have any comments, questions, of course, uh, that are important. But if you do have a comment, question, you can always leave me a comment, of course, uh, either in Canvas or on my channel, uh, and you can also email me. Don't forget also as well. So y'all take care. Y'all have a great rest of the week. Now, of course, see y'all of course, later. So y'all take care. Uh, have a great weekend coming up as well.